Okay, welcome to this week's charting analysis with myself, Jasper Lawler, market analyst here at CMC Markets. Uh, we have the risk warning on the screen at the moment. We're just going to get through that and start the, the webinar very shortly. If you do have a question throughout the webinar, please send it through to our chat window. If it doesn't look like I'm, I'm responding to it, uh, we do have two methods of sending messages here. If you could just try the second second method, then, then I'll typically see it. And um, the plan is to, to get through a few topics and then um, get to those questions uh, towards the end. The whole thing should be wrapped up in, in around half an hour. So we have my next generation platform on screen here. I hope all are seeing that okay. Um, Last week was a busy one. We uh, had the, the week finishing off with the, the non-farm payrolls, but importantly before that we had the, the ECB interest rate setting meeting, the European Central Bank. And um, just to add a little flavor to things, we also had these, these protests over in Hong Kong. So in terms of stock markets, it was quite a big sell-off throughout the week. And then just sort of bounced back Thursday, Friday, particularly in the U.S. markets, in anticipation of and then resulting from the the strong non-farm payrolls number, which ended up coming in um, ahead of expectations at 248,000. The previous month, which had been a bit of a worry, um, was uh, revised higher, um, up to 180,000. So still comfortably uh, 200k plus unemployment, uh, so jobs growth in the U.S. for the third quarter. So that's all um, that's all good news for the U.S. economy and um, in terms of markets, you know, helping to support the, the strong trend in the U.S. dollar that we've been seeing and um, uh, partly offsetting some of the international problems that have caused the, the correction in, in stock markets. So this week probably the FOMC, the, the Federal Reserve in the US, uh, their meetings, uh, their meeting minutes on Wednesday will probably again be the focus um, because keep in mind that at the end of this month should be the, I mean October this month should be the last month of um, quantitative easing. Uh, the, the US uh, FOMC are expected to finish the tapering and so starting November there will be no quantitative easing so from then on in the expectation is that the US are going to raise interest rates and um, people will start already have done and are expected to continue to put their money in US dollar based assets um, just to earn the higher future expected interest rates especially when compared with um, the, uh, the Eurozone which has seen increasingly deteriorating growth and we can see that quite easily when we flip over to um, the euro against the US dollar. This is a uh, five minute chart but if I uh, start off on the weekly perspective this is kind of what we're dealing with here. Now there was a couple of areas that um, you know the euro had the opportunity to, to bounce back and maintain some trend but really haven't broken this wedge pattern it even didn't linger around at um, what I thought might have at least caused a little temporary bounce in the market, the um, 127.50 around these lows. Just smashed straight through it. That week ended way below. The following week with barely any correction of the previous week. Pushed us right through uh, the gap from, uh, from uh, September 2012. That didn't offer any support. So we're we've been down as, as low as 125 and we're just getting a bit of a bounce based on that, uh, that that round number type support notable that um, you know while we're on the top of the US dollar just comparing it against a broad set of currencies by the way we do have the US dollar index available for trading now so you can actually see the US dollar against a broad set of currencies um, I'm yet to actually do some analysis on that but it should be able to just show you that in case you weren't aware, oh, I've actually got it right there. So, got two uh, futures options there. December would be the most actively traded, and that's the one that we've made available. So you can see um, chart. That's a day chart. Um, I, I believe the cash product is um, is on the way. 
where you'd see a, a longer history of the product. But just so you're aware, that would be a way of, of trading the US dollar. But if we have a look at the uh, the dollar yen, this has also recently hit 110 and caused a bit of a reversal. Subsequently, gone back straight away to test it. And in the British pound, we've hit 160. So, um, so some big kind of significant round numbers being hit by the US dollar here. So, it, um, it is, uh, these are some levels in which you know the strength of the US dollar is going to be tested. Um, essentially, the US economy has done its part in terms of um, producing the numbers with the, the non-farm payrolls release. Um, so that's why these, the meeting minutes uh, will be uh, really interesting just to see how the Fed is um, squaring up against these, uh, these strong data points from the U.S. Because um, obviously that's, that's the point, is that you know, it's a strong economy, but the, the Fed have to respond to that strong economy with, an, with, a, with the idea that they're going to raise interest rates um, to, to, you know, just because the low interest rates are not necessary anymore to, to stimulate the economy. <coughs> The uh, the other reason that we've seen a bit of a dip in stock markets, and that's maybe in Germany, there's actually multiple reasons that we've seen this dip. This is a, a daily chart. You can see it quite well on a weekly chart. We could be looking at the prospect of a head and shoulders pattern here. Um, there's the left shoulder there. That's the head. That's the right shoulder. And then so just a break below these perfectly matching lows at um, <clears throat> eight nine hundred essentially. That would be the trigger point of a reverse head and shoulders, and that whole height of that head would then be projected down to below 8,000, I believe, and um, down towards these lows and the uh, the 200-week moving average. <coughs> uh, but there's been various reasons for the declines, one of which has been the the poor data out of Germany, and so something that uh, people had their eye on today was the uh, the factory orders. Um, they actually came in pretty poorly, um, but just because of the strength of the, the U.S. jobs data on Friday, that's the, the sentiment in the market is generally quite quite positive. And uh, so far, the 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 German index is managing to kind of brush those off. But that's really kind of the bullish sentiment from the U.S. is kind of overlapping it for now, but really it's it's more data to suggest that the German economy is weakening. Uh, German economy is weakening, so that's that's um, you know that's not a positive for the German index and it's not a positive for the euro. Uh, the other thing that's been um, causing a, a pull down in prices is um, is China. So that's why uh, on Wednesday. The HSBC services PMI will be a big one. It will be big for um, economies like the Eurozone in the US that have a lot of trade with China. Um, you know, it could cause this um, this drop in in the, da in the DAX in the, in the German 30 to extend. Possibly the first sign that this head and shoulders pattern will, will break down would be a, a break of this rising trend line that we've had on this chart. And, seen for multiple weeks now we've got a few a few touches on there almost another touch but a break through that would be the first sign that that, that, that one's going to break and uh, some you know poor data out of china could be um could be a trigger for that for that to happen so this was this was a pattern we had on the um on the chart for a while, and it's worth noting we've got this longer term head and shoulders, but sometimes you see it in the, in, in the, uh, the oscillators as well. In this case, we had a sort of quite a nice head and shoulders which did play out. We've just got bounced off the 30 level here, and as you can see, the, the you know we've got a good bounce towards the end of last week, um, but the trend is still decidedly down. So for, for trading the DAX, uh, the, the Germany 30. Probably want to see a break of this line. Alternatively, you could draw a similar trend line, or at least using moving averages, just give us a bit of an indication that the, the trend is reversed. Even though we've seen a, a bounce so far, it's just a bounce within a downtrend. Um, so it might require, you know, that that looks 
looks good for now, but um, didn't quite reach the um, the major support from this this trend line. So if we saw that kind of pattern off the support line, we'd be feeling a bit more confident about it. But um, there is still some room for some further downside. So just a, a break of that line would confirm that we're you know, we're looking good again uh, in the Germany 30. As far as the uh, the UK, similar global influences. Um, yeah, I've, I've talked about China. Obviously, that um, the the protests in Hong Kong are sort of ongoing um, uncertainty, um, largely brushed aside by U.S. markets by the end of the week, just on the strength of their, the U.S. data. Um, and it does sort of tend to look like the authorities there, uh, you know, realise they made a mistake with uh, tear gassing all the students um, on, the, on the first day of the protest. Um, and of subsequently, the police presence has been fairly minimal, and they're hoping that these students just run out of steam. Um, you know, when having been on the streets for over a week now. So that that's um, an international consideration. I mean, that could certainly flare up. Um, should the I think the only thing that would probably cause a problems for markets would be again if the authorities stepped in and got, looked a bit heavy-handed. Um, <clears throat> but um, economic, economically, this this week for the, the UK is probably more significant than, than most of the economies. Um, the big one being on Thursday, we have the uh, the Bank of England rate decision. Uh, the data has slipped back a bit in, in the UK as of late, and that's part of the reason we've seen this big decline in the in the British pound. When compared to the, the U.S. dollar, <coughs> it hasn't been able to hold up as well as some might have imagined post the the referendum. Uh, there has been a bit of a weakening, but still, many are predicting that the uh, Bank of England will be the first to hike rates, uh, even ahead of the U.S. So, um, th some indication as to how valid an opinion that is will come from um, the rate decision. There isn't expect. I mean, given the slight slowdown in data. There isn't expected to be any more dissenters than we've had previously. There are currently two dissenters in the decision to um, hold rates steady, uh, two obviously voting for a rate hike. So any sign that there are further dissenters, which we'd only know until the, the, the minutes, um, which don't come out at the time of the rate decision, uh, would give us a clue as to whether uh, there's any increased likelihood of a rate hike from the UK. Um, tomorrow is industrial production um, and manufacturing production figures um, from the, the UK. That will be that will be important um, just ahead of the uh, uh, the meeting, just to give us an idea of this this slowdown, a slight slowdown that we're seeing um, is is still is still occurring, or whether we're going to sort of bounce back. Maybe it's just a slow summer. The other consideration in the background and, and slight change of the guard for the, um, <coughs> the UK economy is that there's been a couple of indications that the housing market is uh, is finally actually slowing, and so house prices actually decreased by a couple of surveys, and we have um, the Halifax and Ricks house price indices uh, this week. So it'll be interesting to see if they also follow suit. Uh, to show a slowdown in the housing market, because that again does actually take the emphasis, uh, take the pressure off the Bank of England to hike rates. So as far as we're looking at this, uh, this chart that we've got in front of us, the UK 100, it would most likely benefit from a Bank of England that is more hesitant to raising rates. Um, the fact that the UK economy has been doing so well has been almost a, an issue for the, the index. Um, just because that, that rate hike has been on the cards for a while now. So if the economy can improve, but a few indications like maybe the housing market, um, yeah, you know, can sort of uh, put, take the pressure off the Bank of England at hiking rates, then maybe this, uh, this index has a bit more chance of breaking this this six nine hundred handle. But as of right now, you can see better on the on the weekly chart. It's really, really kind of range bound. And what's worrying here is that. It's range bound, and yes, we made a couple of lower highs here, but recently it's been in this rising channel. 
and so really just to kind of maintain the bullish momentum you really would have wanted to have seen kind of it to uh, to hit the index up in up in this area up here but it just couldn't make highs above 6900 we saw a bigger reversal which you can see better on the daily chart after the uh, after the referendum and that's we we tanked these couple of weeks alongside other global markets so the fact that it didn't reach the top of that channel and now has subsequently broken the bottom of this channel is not good for for uptrend prospects um, likelihood is we're not about to completely capitulate into a downtrend you know that's got to be your assumption for now um, but it does look like we're in sideways market mode which um, could push up you know this could be the bottom in sideways markets um, you can't be so confident about the future direction because it's not just powering up and you're just looking for dips and you know you know it's the trend is up and you just it's just a matter of where you time it here it's sideways but quite where it ends you know here for example it ended a bit higher than here here it ended there again but it could have easily ended up here here you might have thought it would end up at the top of the channel actually finished a bit lower so whether this is the bottom or in fact it could you know come down as low as this spike from um, October 2013 around the 6300 level or indeed could even drop right down to 6000 uh, 6, which was uh, the low from June 2013 you know, if you're talking that as being the high and that being the low, it would still really be in sideways market mode even if it went down as far as 6,000. Um, so even that, that'd be fairly worrying for you know your portfolio of stocks and definitely have a few people shaken. Technically, it wouldn't quite be a, uh, a downtrend yet. Only a break below there would be the major cause for concern. So given that this this channel is broken, does definitely a slowing momentum. So that's a possibility. Where, where we are right now is a test of this rising channel line. I tend to think because of the sort of sideways mark, uh, nature of what we're doing at the moment, we we'll probably could push a bit through this, this rising trend line. This is probably not going to get tested too strongly. Um, it's probably going to push up. But one of these former levels here, you can see better on the daily chart. Um, we, had this, <coughs> we had this as a double top pattern formally notified on the, on the chart forum with a target down around the lows here which it reached because it coincided with the, the trend line actually smashed right through it so perhaps the, the base of this former double top pattern could offer some resistance on a, a bit of a stronger push higher So if we look at uh, we've got to cover the UK, we look at Germany. Let's have a look at. Um, I did just do an addition to the chart forum for the US SPX. So let's just have a look at US markets. So we've got we've had a um, a reversal candlestick pattern here. These reversal candlestick patterns have to happen at the end of a trend. Really, what we're looking at here is there has been a strong short-term trend, but really, actually, in the, the longer term. It's actually more of a correction than a trend well, on a short-term basis. You, you know, you consider that a trend. So keep in mind that we, you know, it's not at the end of a, pa a, a strong hike up like that. It's more at the end of a correction. But the positive is that it's in the direction of a longer-term trend. So we're facing a little bit of resistance. That's why the candle ended here, based on this this prior low up through there and it's these prior highs from here which correspond to these three highs that we couldn't push through and eventually collapsed so there again particularly at the moment it corresponds with the 21 day moving average um, that is uh, yeah, that's going to be a tough area so this whole zone could be a, a difficult one to, to, push, to cross for US markets so the the, the main impetus for the U.S. right now, and that's probably going to cross over to um, to international markets, is uh, earnings season. <laughs> this week is the official uh, kickoff of earnings season. We've got um, results from Alcoa on, uh, I believe it's Wednesday, and a few other big names from the uh, the S&P 500. So uh, if they start looking like they're going according to plan, then um, that's um, going to be uh, a big reason for 
a next leg high and a new set of multi-year highs, um, all-time highs for these U.S. indices. Because um, yeah, that's the end of the, that's how these um, indices are, are priced. That's how the valuations are judged. Obviously, um, you know, price relative to, to earnings. And so, if these earnings come in um, as they have been in previous quarters, then um, that will be yeah, that will be good for for U.S. stocks and, and probably global stocks. But um, a point of c- concern that um, was again one of the factors behind this recent cor- uh, correction in markets was um, the uh, the strength of the dollar. It's um, it's uh, it's good for the uh, the eurozone, and you know the ECB president Mario Draghi is very very pleased about the uh, drop in the, the euro, uh, the value of the euro against the US dollar. It um, makes European exports more competitive. But obviously, on the flip side of that, it makes U.S. exports uh, less competitive, and so there are a few big in, uh, multinational companies which have been getting a good amount of their earnings growth from abroad, um, particularly like of China and things. So, if there is a stronger dollar, then their uh, not only are their goods and services going to be less competitive because the their goods are going to be relatively more expensive now because of the stronger dollar, but also. Um, when they actually make those earnings in a foreign currency, when they convert it back, um, they're going to get less dollars um, for each one of those uh, euros or British pounds or Chinese yuan have been earned. So that's a slight down. That's a slight risk. Um, but the U.S. economy is not as export orientated as the eurozone is, um, so it won't be such a point of concern and if all the you know maybe it will be a slight boon for the domestic uh, companies who um, may actually end up being beneficiaries of um, lower costs you know the stronger dollar means that they're able to purchase their input costs at a lower relative price and um, so their costs will be lower and so lower costs same earnings means higher profits so on balance um, probably looking for a good good earnings season in the US and um, you know, this, this price pattern that we're looking at on the S&P is setting us up for that. Um, can conversely look at the, uh, the Dow, uh, the, uh, the US 30. So I don't have a five-minute chart because it uh, makes for viewing the non-farm payrolls a little bit better when you're on the five-minute chart. But to really get a feeling as to where we are, see exactly the same pattern on the uh, on the US 30. And um, whereas on the S&P, it bounced pr- nicely off a previous low, here we actually see it bounce perfectly off this 61.8 Fibonacci, uh, which also corresponded with this kind of um, this uh, slight sort of slowdown area over here. And if you, um, you know, so when these when these areas line up, obviously it's not going to, you know, we look at these two of these highs here, that corresponded to kind of the slowdown here. Then we look at, you know, uh, this high slash these highs slash these lows. You can see it all kind of lining up. That alongside the 61.8, that alongside the fact we're in this channel, um, added some support to that area. And so, benefit of hindsight, that was a good place to get in the market. And um, again, we're just kind of testing this 21 day moving average. And uh, we do seem to have broken the short term downtrend. If you were to draw a uh, line through there, it's not that reliable. Only a, I mean, I suppose that does go through sort of three, three highs. So we're through that, so we can maybe expect a, a drop down. Um, no particular U.S. data this week, really, except the FOMC on, when, uh, on Wednesday, which obviously is big. But today and tomorrow, uh, today not too many, not, not too many important earnings. But um, tomorrow, um, the sort of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday tends to be the, the big days for uh, for earnings in the U.S. Monday, people don't like to release results in case there's been something scary over the. Uh, over the uh, over the weekend and um, Friday is the end of the week. We want to go home early. <laughs> so I've co- covered some FX there. Covered some uh, some of the indices. Um, let's uh, let's have a look at commodities. Um, same same story really when it comes to um, commodities. Just. A big part of the reason for their decline is the strength of the U.S. dollar. So if we look at gold straight away, that came within inches today of multi-year lows. So this is um, the daily chart. 
and you can see this is this is the low that we put in in June 2013. Which uh, remember, you know, when you're doing this kind of intermarket analysis, was also the low um, of multiple stock indices as well. So gold um, theoretically a safe haven, but when there's a big sell-off, does tend to get sold off as well. And uh, you know, we've seen a slowdown in stock markets recently, but we've also seen gold come off. So gold is not always a perfect hedge to stock markets. But on the, um, if we look at the longer-term picture here. You know, we can see this is uh, this is kind of big. If we get through here, we're literally at the lowest since 2010. Through there, you know, we're um, you know we're we're threatening a thousand dollars a barrel. Uh, sorry, a thousand dollars an ounce if we break through here. And if you consider this a, um, uh, I've got one of these in the pound as well, which is more better formed. But if I just show you how to use one of these. Um, Fibonacci extension tools is the best way on our platform, I think, to sh oh, whoops. <clears throat> to uh, get the potential objective from a pattern. What we'd be looking at here, if this were a um, a bear pennant or a bear flag, then we'd potentially be looking at 575. Um, dollars an ounce in gold, which um, obviously somewhat goes against consensus right now. Um, yeah, that's probably yeah, that's just something to bear in mind. Doesn't have to be your default assumption. Sell here and take profit here, but um, you know, in terms of long-term picture, that's that's the possibility. That's how big this level is. This um, 11.80. Um, silver is an indication that that could be on the cards because silver's already broken down to a, to a four year plus lows. So if you can see that this is um, this is a pretty long term chart here. <clears throat> so given that we've broken through these, low, this is the equivalent lows in silver. Given that we've already broken through, we have to consider where the next levels are. So we're going up against these lows from May. Um, but now we're looking at the um, resistance and support pivot area from um, you know going back as far as, as 2006. That's around um, 1480 uh, dollars an ounce in, in silver. That could be our next stop. Look at this long-term picture. Okay. Um, the other big one is oil, obviously. And that takes us nicely towards the end of the uh, the session here. I haven't seen any um, any questions coming through the chat. Hopefully, that because that's co I'm covering everything. Hopefully, it's not because you've typed it in a different area and I just don't see. Um, it's the chat window <coughs> that I need that I need to see the messages on. Just looking at brute uh, crude here. Um, this is just an interesting example again, doing that similar technique where, say. Say we're talking about this as a uh, as a triangle pattern. This is the uh, you know the the bottom of it, the, the rising trend uh, trend line from the pattern. Talking about that as the height of the pattern, then you can see that the if you take this as the breakout area, so it's kind of the idea is that that's the height of the pattern. So you'd extend the height down below the breakout area. So that would target about eighty four <coughs> dollars uh, an ounce. Uh, sorry, dollars per barrel in Brent. And you can see it's interesting that these lows, which I had marked out as a um, as potential support areas, some of worked better than others, but they actually work perfectly with these Fibonacci extensions. We've obviously blown straight through the 61.8, which could indicate that this uh, this low is up next, and then possibly even that 100 full full ex full pattern objective. As you can see across all these charts, we're looking pretty overextended with the US dollar. Um, you know, we're touching ninety dollars an ounce in, um, in WTI, um, hundred and ten in dollar yen, one sixty in the British pound, one twenty five in the euro. So there's big round numbers being hit after a big rally in the dollar. So you know, it's risky to go against the trend, but you've got to start assessing what the um, you know what the chances are of a reversal. 
let's just say that WTI as we come into the end of it here. So here WTI got a big long term rising trend line here that I'm sure a lot of people will have on their charts and we broke through that big time last week so we might be looking at a little touch up to the lows around 91-ish and then we'll have to see what the the market does from there but you know this is broken through but we did see a bit of a pullback and um, you know these things aren't exact so that could end up being you know the cause for a, a bounce up again so you know towards 100 again but um, again, like I said, because we have just we have covered that ninety dollars per hour was a big round number. Should that trend line hold and we low, move low again, it does rather look like eighty five will be on the cards for WTI. Um, fundamentally, for for oil, global um, you know, global supplies, um, both in the US. Um, with WTI and um, from the likes of OPEC um, affecting Brent are at multi-year highs. There's, there's lots of production, uh, but demand is, um, is potentially softening a bit. Um, slow down growth in, in Germany and Europe, uh, slow down growth in, in China particularly, and um, some, uh, you know, the, the US economy is faring the best, but still it's not absolutely booming. <coughs> so, um, uh, slight weakening in demand, higher supply is a cause for, for lower prices. So something to watch out for perhaps, and I mentioned this in a um, video snapshot that I did uh, recently, I think it was the last one on, on oil, uh, maybe just an OPEC intervention by cutting supplies would be something to, to push oil prices up. But uh, aside from that, it's hard to see what um, what keep them higher for now. Okay. I think we're going to call that a wrap. Um, thank you very much for attending. hope that was useful. Um, uh, if you sent a message and I didn't see it, apologies, but it uh, looks like we're good to go. Uh, good luck for trading this week. That is uh, Jasper Lawler signing off from CMC Markets. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.